Thank you, Dan, for that very fine speech. I now look to Rehan Asset to continue the case for the opposition. Good evening, everyone. I'm a human rights lawyer and advocate. I want to begin by acknowledging how intimately I understand the desperation of the unheard, the desire to be listened to, for their pain to be acknowledged, to affect change. Tonight, I want to tell you a story about a man with a very fine name, Akbar Hasid, whose ordeal changed my life forever. His crucial message shapes tonight's debate and inform my values. My heart feels with pride to say that this man is my brother. And I hope his story and resilience ingrain themselves in your memory, embodying the power of love and kindness in the face of stark injustice. Akbar is a tech entrepreneur, philanthropist, a wonderful son, an amazing brother, and a shining example of truth, excellence, and grace. Because of his success as a prominent Uyghur tech entrepreneur and his commitment to philanthropy, in 2016, the US State Department invited him to attend one of their most prestigious international visitors leadership program. This program welcomed many world leaders, including this very country's four prime ministers and the current New Zealand's prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, just to name a few. Many of you in this room perhaps have been part of or aspired to take part in these kind of programs. Unfortunately, Akbar's fate could not be further apart from those alumni that I mentioned because he was born into a race other than a pure Chinese nation race, subservient to the Chinese leadership. He languishes in the shadow of Chinese concentration camps, while others in his cohort go on to live full and successful life. But that doesn't mean that he lived his life is not worthy and his story has no impact. After my relentless advocacy pursuing justice for my brother, five years later, the Chinese government finally confirmed that he's alive, albeit he looks like a shadow of his former self. In a short video call with my parents, his message was, be kind, and be kind to everybody. Despite the cruelty he was subject to, his message was kindness and not violence. His words to my parents reminded me of a powerful letter written by Dr. Martin Luther King. In support of non-violent action, while imprisoned in a Birmingham city jail, a city known for its ugly record of police brutality. Such jails are very familiar to me as my brother is held in a solitary confinement in a city called Aksu, notorious for its torture. I can't imagine the corroding despair settling in the darkness, depriving Akbar of ever hope of getting out. His sublime courage, suffering, and commitment to peace has become guiding forces in my advocacy and my values. And this is why I took the position on this side of the house. There are several reasons why the end of the true freedom cannot be achieved through violent means or the position of whatever is necessary. The other side tried to frame the issue in different ways, but whatever necessary means whatever is necessary. First, today from many oppressed community live under surveillance state. 
advanced technology and enables and facilitates the modern autocracy and thereby provides unprecedented tools of repression. China is a perfect example of this tragedy. In a repressive technocratic state, surveillance cameras are installed everywhere to catch the violent resistor. Then it provides an opportunity for the state to label not just him, but his entire community as extremists, and thus paving the way for further crackdown and enhancement of state violence. In the Chinese context, even genocide. Second, history informs us violence begets violence, and the participants of violent protests tend to abandon the very values of why they're fighting for this cause. Point of information. Worse. Sorry, um, you just said violence begets violence, but also in some cases, nonviolence and peace, peaceful protest also beget violence. And you know, to your point, you're saying that people shouldn't do whatever is necessary, but the reality is that sometimes abstaining from doing whatever is necessary just means that your opposition will do whatever is necessary on their end. I think to your point, when you said peaceful violence also become violent, I think we need to understand who are the people infiltrating those protests that actually became violent protests. And this happened in the Hong Kong movement, in many other protests. It's not the protesters themselves who initially launched the peaceful campaign. So, go back to my point. I think they will embody the very thing that they're fighting against, be it oppression, be it an ethnic cleansing. They damage the integrity of the movement and alienate supporters. Sustaining a violent victory means one would rely on coercion and fear to maintain power. Indeed, the Chinese government having once won its own violent revolution, justifies the torment of my brother on the logic of whatever is necessary to preserve security in the Uyghur region. Most importantly, just means of civil disobedience lead to just results, however long it may take. Nonviolent actions achieve the goal and raise the cost for the repressive state. One of the leading scholars, as the proposition quoted, is also a nonviolent protest, is also from Harvard University, named Erica Chenoweth. Previously, she believed that when it comes to repressive government, power flows from a barrel of gun. Although tragic, it is sometimes necessary for people to use violence to seek change. And she did her PhD and she changed her total position because she realized and provided a compelling evidence that nonviolent or civil disobedience, like organizing protests, boycotts, other advocacy methods are the effective means to affect change. Another leading scholar, Omar Wassel, and Oxford's very own expert, Jean Sharp, give further arguments in favor of these views. Leaders and their characters, message, and behaviors influence people at the bottom. Successful nonviolent protests are led by temperate leaders. Their followers espouse those values and thereby achieve lasting change. Rosa Parks, refused to state power to unseat her from a deserving seat that led to the end of bus segregation in the United States. James Baldwin used his powerful words and poetic writings to inform the elite America about racial inequality. Together with many other civil rights activists, they peacefully guided America to a more just and fair country. As we strive to preserve better our democracy, including countries like 
the United States that have witnessed attacks against the capital, we must not resort to violence. I wish the press did not need an outrage that the world were just for, for some everyone, but it's far from the truth. I wish the privileged could understand that how deeply we yearn for a world that shared our cosmic urgency to the promised land of racial justice, as Dr. King put it. But unfortunately, we have to change this cruel reality with strategy, calmness, and high moral standards. Despite sheer cruelty, my brother perseveres. His monumental dignity and his ineradicable humanity shines through. To the, and he exemplifies kindness to the very violence that threatens him. Thus, he became a rallying cry for people all around the world, including a very bright student at this fine university who invited me to this stage. The Uyghur people all around the world exemplified this courage and speaking up against the world's second most powerful country. Ladies and gentlemen, if you care about human dignity and freedom for brave, resilient, kind individuals like my brother, I hope you advocate for peaceful disobedience. Some say riots are the language of the unheard. I emphasize with that sentiment, with the rage and despair of the perceived powerlessness to correct an injustice that deeply affects me, as well as anyone, but to win a better future for the Uyghurs and all the oppressed. Perhaps we should show that the unheard is also capable of kindness, for it is a language the likeliest to win us to the ultimate victory. Thank you.